creatively dreaming about invisibility. The first thing that comes to my mind is Harry Potter, who's a young boy wizard who comes to inherit, to inherit a very special cloak from his dad. And when one drapes his cloak over his or her shoulders, the person underneath vanishes. And we are led in the story to experience the freedom that comes with invisibility, the mischief sometimes that comes with invisibility, to be able to wander unseen, to explore and invent and make mistakes even without anyone else seeing who is doing it. And the only person privy to those exploits would be the person under the cloak. Another thing that comes to mind when I think about invisibility is camouflage. Predators and prey alike find ways to blend into their surroundings in ways that only natural selection could invent. Some chameleons can even change their color in order to more perfectly blend with their surroundings. What comes to mind is that awesome commercial of the chameleons trying to pick a pink color for their room. They're stepping on swatches and turning that color. They're like, well, what color do we want to be for the rest of our life? Sometimes, the butt of a joke, these fascinating creatures find ways to unite with creation, to, stru to survive creation, and to hide from predators. There's even a thing now called invisibility science. While we're probably a long way out from developing invisibility cloaks, scientists are constantly developing things like, like tanks that are invisible to infrared sensors, uh, acoustic invisibility cloaks that makes water firing ships and submarines and even seismic invisibility cloaks, underground concentric circles that protect buildings from earthquakes. Certainly, when we dream of the future, we dream of invisibility and other such magical invention. But what if I were to tell you this morning that invisibility is not so far out of reach? What if I were to tell you that invisibility has been around almost as long as human community? There are among us, even now, this morning, invisible people. Invisible people sitting in this room. Invisible people walking the streets of central Illinois. Invisible people all over the world. But if I were to tell you that invisibility is nothing new, that it's only a moment past or ahead of us. I remember a cold, damp morning in San Francisco. Maggie and I stopped at Starbucks before church. Normally on Sundays, I would hike out another hour and a half earlier um, and get some Starbucks on my own, sit and read a book until I had to go to my teaching parish internship site. But this particular morning, I was giving Maggie a ride into San Francisco so that she could go to her church, and I was off that Sunday. So we decided to stop for coffee together. And as we were walking into Starbucks, I noticed a woman sitting on the sidewalk outside the doors of the coffee shop. She was holding out a cup asking for change. We made eye contact as I pulled into my parking space. I told her that I didn't have any cash on me. And then an employee came out and yelled at her saying, get out of here, I've told you already, you can't do this here. And you know what my first thought was? That particular morning as I wasn't on my way to my teaching parish site, my first thought was, I'm glad I'm not wearing my collar today. What if I were to tell you that invisibility is nothing new? My CPE site, which is the chaplaincy internship that we're required to do in seminary, was at a senior living center. One woman suffering from MS pulled me aside one day and told me this. You know, I'm a creative writer, and I used to dedicate my evenings to writing, since I can't do much else. But the people here that forced me to go to bed at 6 o'clock right after dinner they say it's easier that way for them because then they can get home. And I don't want to be a bother, so I guess I will just have to stop writing. What if I were to tell you that visibility is nothing new? A recording of a presidential candidate has recently been released as a community devoted to justice, love, peace, and respect for all human beings. We condemn these comments as sexual assault and evidence of rape culture. So too do we condemn all acts of domestic and sexual abuse, and we welcome with healing arms the unnamed, the faceless victims of violence. Human beings with names and families currently occupy invisible status. A man with a deadly skin disease travels over a hundred miles on foot to find a healer. 
And when he arrives, the healer will not even see the diseased man, but instead sends a messenger to tell him and go and wash himself. The invisibles are among us. Visibility is here. The second king's text for today seems to be about healing at first. It seems to be about a man who seeks Elisha, the prophet, the man of God, out, bathes in the river Jordan, and is made clean. But I think that this is instead a story about invisibility. Naaman is not a person of small political influence, and yet he seems invisible to Elisha. Let us remember who Elisha sends to meet Naaman, a messenger. This great Aramean military commander has traveled over a hundred miles, not only to see this prophet and be healed, but also to be seen by this prophet. Naaman brings with him horses and chariots, a bunch of treasure, and some very impressive clothing. And what other sort of entourage could say so pointedly, look at me? But this suffering person instead finds himself listening to a messenger, the renowned prophet nowhere in sight. It seems like a wave of the hand dismissal on the part of the healer, and Naaman goes away unseen, invisible, and furious. Elisha pushed him aside, and I have to ask this morning, wasn't this a lousy thing to do, Elisha? But we know the end of the story. We know that God's power is not dependent on our connection, on our relationships. We know that Naaman's disciple convinces him to wash and the leprosy is healed. So why does it matter if the instructions come from the mouth of a servant or a religious leader? The story shows that God works despite miscommunication, and we know that God heals Naaman. But Naaman's anger is real. His rage was real. Elijah did not take the leper's suffering seriously enough, in my opinion. He did not take the person as a human being serious, seriously. He did not take Naaman as a child of God seriously. Elisha himself even says, let him come to me that he may learn there is a prophet in Israel. Not come to me that he may be healed, but come to me that he may learn there is a prophet in Israel. In the midst of ministry, Elisha hides from Naaman's need for empathy, for incarnational presence. Tucked away safely in his house, God's prophet takes care of the letter, takes care of the problem, takes care of the disease, but does not take care of the person's spirit. Hence Naaman's rage, hence Naaman's invisibility. This Holy One of God, this person called to minister to God's people, had forgotten how to take suffering seriously. Elisha had become so used to the elevated status as God follower, so comfortable with his faith, so isolated in that comfort, that he doesn't take Naaman's suffering seriously. If I could, I would ask Elisha this, have you never been invisible? Has your yoke ever been hidden from the eyes of others but remained heavy on your heart? Have you ever suffered, ever been rejected? Elisha, what about all those times Elijah was just going to leave you as if your devotion was some fleeting fancy? Did you not feel invisible then? Or when God sent you to that woman's house to be fed, a house already nearly empty of food, only to witness her son's death and the mother's grief? Elisha, you too have been invisible, maybe even still. And all of us here, we too know what it is to be invisible. We know what hidden grief feels like. We know what loneliness, fear, and rejection mean. The world around us is full of invisible people, blotted out by systems that seek to disempower, by brokenness and sin which separate and imprison. And in those times of hurt or shame or rejection, do we not seek kindness as well as justice? Do we not seek human connection as well as solution? Sometimes it is easy to condemn sexual assault and rape, but difficult to fight against it. Sometimes it is easy to say casually in a conversation that, of course, objectification and dehumanizing is wrong, but it is hard to steer ministry to address rape culture. Inaction is a road to perpetuation. Inaction is a form of not seeing. Inaction is a form of privilege and neglect. For those of us who are blessed to live lives free of sexual assault, we do our sisters and brothers a disservice when we cannot fight for the human dignity of those around us. 
for those of you here this morning who have felt the pain of sexual or domestic violence, we stand with you. We are sorry for our complicity in this rape culture, and we seek at the same time to dismantle that rape culture. We see you. Human beings, people with faces, names, families, bodies, memories, scars, dreams, goals, and dignity. We see you. We stand with you. Now, like Elisha, like any human being, it can be hard to extract ourselves from the habit of unseeing. But God calls us to see. God calls us to take the suffering of the world seriously, to take the suffering of our neighbor seriously. The world is angry, and it should be. We too should be angry. We too are called to be leaders, and as leaders, as Christians, to see the invisibles, to pull back the curtain and reveal the world in its true condition, diseased and in need of healing. Let us venture out of our homes, out of our pulpits, and into the broken arms of the suffering. Ministers, business people, Managers, musicians, teachers, parents, laborers, public responders, families, groups of friends, all disciples of love and justice must engage intimately with the world. We must begin to know the suffering of the world. Think of all those times that you have felt invisible, when no one has noticed you, when no one sees how you suffer. <clears throat> but God knows the suffering of the world. And God suffers in solidarity, suffers in kind with the hidden. To God, there is no invisible. God has claimed each of us as children of God, has known us even as we were formed in the womb. Before we were born, we were consecrated. God loves everyone as a part of that knowing. And as we engage intimately with those around us, those that culture has deemed unworthy of visibility or at least inconvenient, God remains in the suffering. When someone is sexually assaulted, God has been sexually assaulted. When someone feels the sting of a loved one strike them, God too has been struck by a loved one. When someone is objectified and made to feel worthless, so too is God made less than and felt to be worthless. God waits to be liberated, waits in eager longing for the revealing of the children of God, waits for us to make authentic, empathic connections with the suffering world around us. If and when you find yourself in Elisha's shoes, when you find yourself possessive of a gospel so magnificent, so freely given, so selfless, so transformational, so healing, when you find yourself in Elisha's shoes, you are called to see those who are coming seeking help. God is not just an answer designed to keep people at arm's length, nor is God a means to elevate our status as prophets, God's work is so much more than handling our affairs away from real life. Writing a check and calling it good doesn't do the trick. Saying a prayer and naming abuse in casual conversation is not enough. We are called to meet people on the road, as we would wish to be met. To gaze into the eyes of those in need and to hear stories of persecution. So may we go from this place inspired not only with voice, but also with godly power. Power to uproot the mulberry trees. Power to heal the high as well as the low. Power to dismantle violent cultures. And above all, power to change the world in God's name. Amen.